a warm welcome to this special interview here for Kaya Biz with myself, Kukule Tumfupi, the host of Kaya Biz, which broadcasts every Monday to Thursday between 6 and 8 o'clock. Now, you would know that usually during our feature of Pivot Point, we speak to influential business leaders who give us some insight into their journeys, both professionally and personally, that have been influenced and pivoted by a myriad of factors. Some of their key thought leadership lessons that have been learned throughout their careers and of course insight that they can also share with us in terms of their journey and most importantly some pivotal impact that they would like to leave within the industry and today i'm joined by a phenomenal guest someone who i have long admired uh, following through her journey and uh, even sought to study accounting myself uh, because of the example that she set in the industry known as the first black qualified female chartered accountant in South Africa, a key entrepreneur through the founding of her own auditing and accounting firm, which has since then transitioned to be one of the leading and largest black owned uh, auditing firms, not only in South Africa, but across the continent. She is a legend. She is an icon. And if I tell you the truth, she's also a new author of a newly uh, authored and published book, Awakened to My True Self. We're joined today in studio by Nongkululeko Koboto. Mam Nongkululeko, such a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much, Gugu. Such a delight <laughs> to have you. I must say, just reading through your bio and your profile, which I haven't even done completely, I think one is obviously aware uh, of the milestone and the privileges and um, the impact that you've really had within our uh, economic society in South Africa. So thank you so much for your contribution and your time today. Very happy to be here. Fantastic. Let's start with First Things First, a new book that you took two years to author. Tell us more about it. Yeah, I was telling them at the launch <laughs> <laughs> that I'm now an author. I have yes. a new title. <laughs> Very exciting. So not just a numbers girl, but a wordsmith as well. Yeah, <laughs> it was scary though. It was scary though because people were putting so much pressure on me mm -hmm. to write a book. And people were offering to write the book for me. And I thought, yeah, maybe I need an author to a writer to actually write the book. But after a while, I thought, no. You know, I'm the only one who can really tell my story True. better than anyone else. And <clears throat> so I decided, no, I'm going to write this book myself. Then the issue was, okay, people are expecting an inspirational book, mm -hmm. you know. But I know the truth. I know that I've had a life of ups and downs. I've made mistakes and I've learned from them. And I'd like especially young people to, to learn from those mistakes with me. And so it was that thing. Okay, so we want to write the good, the bad, and the ugly. Sure. And how ugly? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, I had the courage to really just tell the story as it is. I think that's a very refreshing perspective, right? Because you are a pioneer. Uh, as mentioned, every building you walk into, everybody refers to you as that individual who really broke barriers and really uh, provided a pathway for many more black females like myself to actually enter the world of financial services. So I'm keen to understand just how deep is the truth, just how... Well, we, bad is the bad uh, and ugly is the ugly. Um, and, and I ask this from a vulnerability point of view. Why was it important for you to be that honest in your book? Yeah, I suppose nice stories inspire people. Mm. But the truth really changes people. Mm -hmm. I'd like people to, to be not just inspired by my book, but to heal. There's a lot around mental illness that mm. I suffered myself. A and I share in the book how I went through that and how I got healed from that. And I share in the book about my passion around race and gender issues. Yes. Because for me, I've always been worried about the fact that, you know, yes, we've had our protest action and it has gotten us to where we are. But I always had this trouble that there is a lot that depends on others to change. If white people would change, mm -hmm. things would be okay for black people. If men would change, things would be okay ah. for white for, for for women. And and I kept thinking, but what about us? Surely there's something that we need to do to change the situation. And and so I, I really just share my thoughts around how I believe we should deal with these two big issues. Yeah. And, and of course, I share my journey of my passion around business and yes. leadership and all of those interesting things that people 
love definitely about me. Maybe let's start there, right? Before we get into the context of getting to know you as Umam Nongkululeko. Uh, and, and let's talk business because as we've heard, you've been an entrepreneur. You have had the influences of your father motivating you. Umam Moizman Nongkulu himself, who's the first black chartered accountant in South Africa, which actually helped to establish Goboto Inc. Take us back to that journey in, what was it, the late 80s, early 90s, where you thought, no, man, I'm a young lady from the Transkei, but I can do this thing myself. <laughs> What motivated you and encouraged you? And I think even some of the lessons and insight in terms of the difficulties, but the highlights of that journey. Yes. I mean, I suppose it starts with even knowing what I wanted to do with my life. Yeah. <laughs> I felt pregnant when I was 17. I, I thought my life had ended. I was a shy girl who didn't know who she was. Mm. My mother was like, yo, this one. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how she's going to turn out in life. <laughs> yes, mm. and 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 that incident of falling pregnant really changed my life because that's when uh, I I went to work for my father's panel beating shop, and I got challenged. You know, being bullied by white managers, and being you know taught bookkeeping, and wow. <laughs> what uh, I learned bookkeeping like this, uh, um, I was able to stand up to those bullies, uh -huh. and I realized that no, I'm not this thing that my mother thought I was. I'm actually smart. I'm actually strong, and now I know what I want to do with my life because I was exposed to chartered accountancy. Yes. Professor Nkutlu was the way our auditors, and I told my dad. Now that I know what I want to do, I want to be a chartered accountant. Okay. But of course, I never knew that I would be the first black woman chartered accountant. I just had my own vision of being a chartered accountant. And then the results come out. I'm excited. I've made it. Uh -huh. Then the following day, it comes out. You are the first. Okay. Even then, I didn't realize what that meant. At that time? At that time. Because I, I never really... There are people who wanted to be first, but for me, this thing of being first was never important. Mm, tell us Until why, media <laughs> descended on my small <laughs> town of Amtata. <laughs> no, I mean, the dream was to be a chartered accountant. There are people who had, you know, started before me. So I, I thought that maybe they must have been a first before or something mm. like that. Then media descended, and suddenly I was in the spotlight. Suddenly I was being interviewed for TV, magazines, and all of that. And I was so like, So what oh, happened please, to this shy girl? Yes. Please, I'm just a shy girl <laughs> from the trans guy. I don't need all this attention. And until this guy from the SABC sobered me up and said, no, it's not about you. Mm. You are now a role model for many women and for many young people. So that's when the journey started. I lost my life from there. <laughs> <laughs> lost your life or created it? Because if you ask many South Africans, I think they'll tell you, boy, have you crafted a beautiful journey for yourself. Help us unpack very briefly, if you can, because I know this took literally decades on end, moving from Koboto Inc. to uh, where we are now, uh, Seasons Abul Saluba Koboto Inc., uh, which is the fifth largest um, auditing firm in South Africa and on the continent, really. Quite a journey, tumultuous, and as you've often described in your book, uh, mergers and acquisitions are not always that easy. Not at all. But I mean, it, it's just amazing how something starts with just yourself and a PA, and then you dream again that, no, I mean, it's after 1994, let's seize this moment and create a medium-sized black accounting firm, which is when Koboto Inc. was born in 1996. Mm -hmm. Certainly grew to 10 partners and 200 staff and offices. And, and for me, that is one business that I'm always passionate about because we were building from scratch, creating a foundation from nothing. Mm. Whereas when you compare with Susan Zaluba Koboto, we're building from something. Um, uh, and then, of course, we have to dream again. Stella Stau, when he gave us, she gave us these opportunities yeah. of opening the the likes of Transnet to us, which we never even dreamt would ever be auditors of a big corporation like like Transnet. Mm. And and you you then have to say, she didn't think that we would always be playing second fiddle to the big four forever. Exactly. And then that bug Hit started again. hitting me again. There's another mountain to climb. I have this dream of a big black accounting firm. And again, I have to convince my colleagues who are now comfortable. They've built this medium-sized uh, mm. black accounting firm. 
firms. And so are you saying we must risk everything Nunguleko, for this crazy dream of yours? What if the market is not ready for us? And um, you persuade them and they buy into the vision. But then, okay, you prepare yourself. You know that measures are difficult. You prepare yourself, but I promise you, going through that major, mm -hmm. I could never have imagined how hard it would be. Really? No, because remember, we've got two sensible businesses. We're putting them together. And the integration of those two is just difficult. There are equals to deal with. I mean, we had a big fight over what is the name of the firm? I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, the people are first. saying, no, uh, Nongkleko is the only founder who is here, so the name should be Koboto Sis or something. And the sister guys are saying, no, we want all of our name there, and it must be in front. I had to swallow my own pride and say, this vision is bigger than me. I woke up one day and I said, the name of this firm is Sis Wenzaloba Koboto. Let's move on with it. Mm. And then the major. Ooh. What we didn't anticipate is that culture would be such a big issue mm. because remember we have a shared history. We've struggled together. We fought to, to, to get a share of the pie. Uh, and, and so this should be a piece of cake for us. Gotcha. But what we didn't realize is that how we did business was completely different. From the Goboto side, we were disciplined, decision-making, um, and all of those things. Technically and, aligned. <laughs> yes, and from the CISO side, they were more you know, creative. I, I really, really was, was surprised by some of the interesting things that they had done. Gotcha. But with that comes a little bit of ill -disi discipline and things like that. And then we realized that this was now a deal breaker. This merger can fail if we don't fix this culture thing. And we, we then had to come up with interventions to integrate the two cultures because there was a lot of good in both of them. Mm. And you have to create something new anyway because we must forget the legacy firms, gotcha. you know, uh, and move forward with a new vision, with a, with a new identity as a new firm. If I can jump in there, Mam Nungulu, I'm keen to understand how you can share and impart some lessons here with some of the entrepreneurs who might be learning as to how that speaks to the power of partnerships, but also the, the sacrifices, the uh, 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 negotiations that need to take place. Because as you're describing here, it's creating a new culture, but not just for yourselves as executives and leaders and founding fathers of this institution, but it had to ripple down right down to operations on the ground from front desk through the auditors and the other professionals in the organizations mm. to make sure that it's efficient. So what lessons, I guess, have you learned about this in terms of partnership, specifically within the business sphere? And I suppose, I mean, especially as black entrepreneurs, why we've not been able to, to build big businesses is mm. because we want our own thing, mm. you know? We're comfortable with our own little thing. And, and, and one thing I admire about accountants is that we've been able to be willing to sacrifice that but but again i mean if you talk about the major itself that sacrifice meant remember there were two firms yes there was a head of this head of this a ceo of ceo blah 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 mm. you know and, and so who now must sacrifice and not be the head of the department that's where the sacrifices started you know and 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 uh, who's going to hold which position and and so on and and then of course i mean when it when it comes to culture you are used to your own culture True. i tell you myself i was saying along the passages yo this couple this is with people and they were saying yo this couple to people because you want to hold on to your own culture mm. you don't want to change but eventually we did build a new culture you know and 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 we had not lost staff during the major, mm -hmm. but that's when we lost staff, when the new culture was now emerging and people gotcha. couldn't identify with it. They loved the entrepreneurial firm that we used to be. Now we're an institution building mm -hmm. structures, building systems, building processes, and people are like, no, this is not for me. Mm. But it was a good thing also because let's rather attract the talent who will be able to, you know, adapt to the new culture. Very true. I find this so fascinating because, uh, as you say, uh, uh, as a lot of black entrepreneurs, we really feel isolated in terms of building our own thing. And we forget that sometimes who you start the journey with might not be the team that you uh, end off the journey with. So that's another critical lesson that I think we often need to understand. And 
How have you managed that? Um, they often say in politics, there's no permanent enemies or friends. <laughs> Is the same uh, statement true in business? I always tell people who come to me for advice, you know, who are putting together a business and maybe it's six of them, they're yes. around the table, they're excited. And I would warn them in the beginning, uh, I don't know how many of you will be there <laughs> by the time you launch this business. So it's the same. Mm -hmm. it's, it has been the same with me. Whenever, even in the major, there were five firms who were around the table when we started. We ended up with two mm. uh, at the end. So, but it, it is good because you want to partner with the right people. Yeah. Because, I mean, the biggest mistake we can make is to partner with the wrong people. Definitely. Yeah. So I, I never mind those who pull away because they were not part of this journey anyway in the, from the beginning. But, I mean, as black people, we need to understand that unless we're willing to work, work together, unless we're willing to put down the egos, we're not going to build anything big. I find that so important, especially at this particular time. Off air, we were discussing the fact that Tutuga, which is uh, a bursary fund uh, under SICA, really looking to drive transformation, a bursary fund provided for uh, uh, individuals of color to actually start a study the CA stream, um, celebrates 30 years. And that's a milestone in itself. And I'm keen to understand you yourself have sit, sat on boards of companies, um, have, you know, led and grown businesses and coming back to this theme of transformation, a challenging one. Do you think we've done enough? Aside from the BE policies, aside from the woke culture that we have in society, what else needs to shift or change in order for us to really pivot to, I guess, reach the targets and objectives that we want to attain when it comes to transformation, both in terms of race, gender, and full-on inclusion? You know, I'm just so tired of complaining. Yeah. I'm tired of blaming. As black people, we need to take charge of our own transformation, mm -hmm. which is a big theme of my book around... Um, what economic transformation looks like where you are in charge uh, of your own transformation. Because again, for me, this, there's this mind shift that we need as black people. It's very comfortable to complain. It's very comfortable to blame corporate, to blame white mm. people, to blame this. We are talented people. We are, you know, smart people mm -hmm. as, as black people and women. You know, I, I include both of these Definitely. two groups because I call them the disadvantaged groups. But I'm saying that, you know, in the book, there, there is a need for us to awaken to who we truly are. Remember that our identity has been defined by myths that have been created around True. us. And, and to some extent, we've believed these myths. And when you believe something, it sort of defines who you are and your reality in life. So there needs to be this shift mm. in finding who we truly are, finding our authentic power. Does that also include holding each other to account? Because so often we also get accused of the public fa failures of black business that override the successes, unfortunately. Yes. Again, it's because of these beliefs. Be you know, when, when we won Transnet as Susan Zaloba Kobot, mm -hmm. the first thing everybody said was, including our own people, Yo, can we do it? Can we really do it? Ah. Because the, the international firms were saying, you'll never be able to do it. And we had to release ourselves from those beliefs that we cannot do it. Mm -hmm. And the minute we believed that we could do it, the minute myself and Victor convinced our people that we could do it, certainly we could do it. So these beliefs have a lot to do with these failures, yeah. in my view. So we need to share them and we need to find our true selves. We definitely do. And that does speak to how all of that has evolved to SNG Grant Thornton. As you say, more focus on black entrepreneurs coming together and really growing and grooming their businesses. Keeping with transformation but this time around black females I, I mentioned that I was one of those young black females who was identified in school and they said oh gooks you're good in maths you're good in science and accounting CA stream is the way to go and the beauty is that along that journey following through with the qualification and the degree but media found me and I fell in love with it but what has been instrumental to my growth in my career I found is again mentorship both from men and women coming back to your father Professor Nkutlu, uh, looking at uh, the leaders as well of Sizu and Saluba, uh, uh, Sizu and Saluba specifically at the time, I'm keen to understand what are your thoughts on the role that men play when it comes to the empowerment and development and mentorship of women in their careers? No, I mean, definitely. I, I, was, I also always share that I was mentored by Doug Southgate, who at that time when, you know, as you enter the door as a black woman, you are dismissed. Uh, people assume that you're not capable. Mm. 
but he he saw the talent in me and supported me through my career and I'm always grateful to him for opening the kind of opportunities that he opened for 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 me and and there are many men who have done this who have you know mentored black women for instance but sometimes you know the the the, the stories are very hurtful mm-hmm. where they've brought women down and work them out of the system because they are too powerful that you know you must know your place as a woman mm. and 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 women often have to to you know abandon who they truly are and and bring this face to make other people comfortable mm. those things need to stop because women have a right to progress in corporate yeah. like anyone else definitely without the patriarchal ad- attitude uh, that might take place within those spaces. And now that you mention that, for those who are just joining us, we are in conversation with Umam Nungululego Koboto, uh, newly uh, author of the book Awakened to Myself and really been reflecting on some of her highlights and insights uh, to uh, establishing her growth in entrepreneurship, being the first black chartered accountant, and of course, lessons in terms of leadership and mentorship and how this has now led to the founding of SNG Grant Thornton. But beyond that, you've spoken about being a woman in the workplace. Let's talk about being a woman at home. I was um, commenting as well off air that so often when we speak to female executives like yourselves, and if you consider Women's Day, the first question that's often asked is, how do you balance it all? Being a wife, being a mother, being an executive. And these are often questions that we've now begun to challenge even asking our male counterparts, right? Because they too have a lot to balance. But when you look at yourself 30 years ago, going through the changes and transitions that you had to go through as a wife, as a mother, raising your children, but still building a phenomenal business. Can you have it all? Or at the same time? (laughs) No, (laughs) definitely. I mean, it's just choices we make. And and some of those choices were very hard because I got divorced when I was 34 with three kids. And my, my ex didn't get involved even in terms of parental support or financial support. So I had to support these children and, and build my own life. So you're going to and soccer and balancing a board meeting? Ex-co. Yeah. And sometimes once in a while, when I was building that business, um, my children really suffered. And, and later on in life, we had I had to confront their wounds because they were wounded mm-hmm. by the fact that I was, I was not there. They were always, uh, you know, uh, the the ones who had to get leaves from other mothers when going on on outings and my son would say, can I please just have my mother being part of this tour today wow. and things like that. I mean there was a lot of guilt that that came with it, and and I often ask myself whether you know the market would have waited for me should I have slowed down or anything like that. But look at Bokaya and Goku. Yeah, <laughs> they are big people <laughs> living their own lives. But uh, there has to be fairness in this whole issue of balance because we only talk about balance around women. We don't Mm. talk about balance when it comes to men. When both the mother and father are working in in the family, why is it the wife who must balance? So so we need to, to find some equity in how we play these roles in the home because women, they, they, they need to, to have, you know, capacity to, to build their own careers True. as well without everybody suffering, mm-hmm. without the children suffering, for instance. So uh, I, I, I'm always proud of U- Ukaya, who who is divorced but spends 50% of the time with the kids. So 50% there with the mother, 50% with him. Yeah. These things can be done. Are you a proud mother and grandmother now? <laughs> yes, <laughs> very much so. <laughs> And I think that's important because as an individual, you need to live a full life, right, in all your capacities. And maybe I can I can ask you what what you speak to your grandchildren about (laughs) and when they want to be pioneers and break through new industries and recording TikTok videos. You know, I just want to love my (laughs) sorry, my my grandkids and don't want to put any pressure because I put so much pressure on their parents. But then when they come and say, Mama, uh, I have an ass- Makulu, I've got an assignment of a famous person. <laughs> so we have a famous person in the family. And then I'm drawn back to talking about my story to them. Oh, wow. <laughs> it takes us back to those years in the 80s, as you said, where that SABC reporter said, this is influential, right? A- and on that note, is it difficult being a pioneer, walking into the room and always being labeled as this business leader, the first black, the first female, the first, first, what kind of pressure comes with being the first? It started from the beginning when when I realized that I was now a role model because 
soon I was then receiving letters from young boys from KwaZulu Natal. Mama, Sisi, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. And 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 wives who were saying, I'm going back to school because I know now I can be anything I, I want to be mm. because of you. Then this pressure really builds up and, and people are looking up to you. So whatever you do, you cannot fail. I mean, I remember when we were putting together Susan Salubak about the failure was not an option because the whole nation was looking up to us. True. You know, uh, black professionals were looking up to us. So you, you, you don't have your own life, <laughs> unfortunately. And you're still not going to have much of a life now, now that you've authored this book, Awakened. And it's uh, the name and the title also goes in line with another initiative that you also have, also by the same name, speaking towards leadership, transformation, as well as woman development. Tell us more about that. Yes, uh, this it's is my passion now. It's what I want to spend the rest of my life on. You know, I have this thing that I've got three beautiful granddaughters. I want them to arrive at a different world. Uh, I've, I've always, you know, dealt with these issues of gender and race and transformation in my own way. But I really want to contribute um, significantly, sort of significantly now uh, around these issues because... You know, we have a duty as this generation mm. not to leave this mess to our children. Mm. And and even if it's a small shift that I achieve, I, I want to dedicate my life to this thing. And, and my whole theme is around how do we focus on ourselves and stop blaming the other? Because to me, white people... They see superiority as their identity, you know. They need someone to be inferior for them to continue to be superior. Hmm. But who can they be superior to if black people no longer see themselves as inferior? Sure. So I, I want us to deal with our own mindset around believing that we're inferior to white people. Uh, uh, because once we shift those beliefs, mm. I believe that we will shift the dial. Because, I mean, in a, in a husband and wife situation, mm -hmm. you know, there's this blame. He is the problem. She is the problem. But the minute one of the spouses decides not to blame but focus on themselves, mm. there's a change in the marriage. I believe we can change this thing. I find that so critical, especially given the society we're in. We know that we're headed to elections here next year in South Africa. Black youth, black females still remain members of the disenfranchised in our communities. And even as you say, from a social structure point of view, there's still a lack of confidence in, in terms of ourselves as black individuals when it comes to being pioneers in this industry and, and in lives in general. Now that you've authored this book, many people will get their hands on it. They'll read it. They'll know more about your story. We'll come back to you with facts and figures saying, Mama, good day, Nikwenze, good. Um, but as you say, there's uh, something that you'd like to leave with them as a pivotal experience, which speaks to the initiative as uh, Awakened Global. For the person who's going to read this book, male, female, young, old, black, white, what's the one thing you hope they walk away with? That we can change the world. We can change. You know, I, I end the book with saying, I see a future South Africa where my grandchildren will be proud to be African mm. because Africans are people who are respected. So I, I want to change the mindset around especially Africans. Mom Nongkurule, it was such a pleasure speaking to you today. I am not a CA today, but I'm delighted that in my own way, in my own capacity, I can contribute to the economy and follow up in the footsteps that you and many others have pioneered. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this lovely talk. <laughs> <laughs> Onwards and upwards.